Uh, you also uh, co-authored the first study on orgasmic meditation. Can you explain what that is? And is there any similarity between that and like tantric sex? Mm -hmm. The practice itself of orgasmic meditation, the core of it is 15 minutes of manual genital clitoral stroking. So this is a woman lying down with uh, generally undressed from the waist down or skirt up and the partner, male, female, whomever beside her sitting upright and they're putting their finger just beside the clitoral shaft and stroking very, very, very slowly for 15 minutes. And the goal is just to feel. So they're not actually trying to have an orgasm despite the name. <laughs> and the uh, groups that do this claim a variety of health benefits from it. So, you know, they say that they they may feel more centered or help with their depression or anxiety. And our studies in uh, orgasmic meditation are largely about testing some of those claims. So this is a great protocol for a lab. You know, it's really, really hard um, to, uh, hard <laughs> to study, <laughs> sorry, um, to study two people interacting in the lab because we can't just bring them in and say, okay, y'all have sex and then we're going to study it. Because <laughs> what is having sex? Like we're going to yeah. get, you know, for every couple that comes in, there'll be something different. In a lab, we have to have a controlled setting. Like we have to have certain things happen at certain times so that we can know uh, with timestamps where in your brain, you know, that happened. And um, so we brought these couples in who knew how to do orgasmic meditation uh, to do this while we recorded brainwaves from both people. And then we got some additional measures on the person doing the stimulation. We measured their arm movements using electromyography, these eight uh, metal plates around their forearm. And in the person receiving the stimulation, we also got uh, their heart rate and something called galvanic skin response. It's just like micro sweat. And so we've been publishing the behavioral data, which is just them telling us how they felt. Um, the data we have coming out next are about the brainwave <laughs> data. And then ultimately we wanna integrate those so some of the things we found, this is like the most obvious science in the world, but there's a reason <laughs> for it. So people, after they do genital stroking, they feel closer to one another. <laughs> that was literally the first paper. And you may say, well, like, no kidding. You know, you needed science for that. And I totally get that. But that's actually really debated. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, that is, there are a lot of therapists included who believe if you have some kind of a genital interaction with somebody who's not your romantic partner, that that can't be healthy, that it's promiscuous or it's wasted or like they use all this terrible language around it. And so we said, just to start out, we just have to demonstrate that people had a positive experience <laughs> doing this. So we just looked at their like reports before and after, depending on if the partner they came in with were their regular romantic partner or just somebody else. And it turns out like the somebody else had just as many benefits and more in some cases. So uh, that's what we're continuing to do work on now is like, okay, you know, what, what other claims have they made and can we document those? You know, how can we show that in the physiology and also in the experience? That brings up a, a question that I actually wasn't, I hadn't even thought about until just now. I remember a friend of mine telling me that when women orgasm, they release a certain chemical that creates like, it's like bonding. It's, I think it's like the same chemical that supposedly is um, created between like a mother and child. Like there's mm -hmm. that, there's that chemical. Is that, is that true? The oxytocin has more changes with sexual arousal, actually not with climax. Uh, the bigger okay. change when you have a climax is in vasopressin. Uh, and just to dispel another myth, a lot of people think orgasm causes a flood of dopamine. Um, the dopamine that's been measured actually is not associated with climax. It's associated with sexual arousal. And so what that means is there are a lot of things we prescribe to orgasm, like, oh, you got to do, you know, get to climax because you get your dopamine hit or you get your oxytocin that's going to bond you to your partner. You actually don't need it for that. <laughs> like, the main thing orgasm does is uh, we think vasopressin is a somnolent, which means the thing that helps you fall asleep after. <laughs> so uh, it may be that the, the kind of biggest effect of that is to kind of knock you out afterwards, mm -hmm. um, possibly. Uh, these things are very, very poorly studied. We're actively doing a study actually looking at inflammatory markers before and after climax because they've never been studied before. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so I would say like th that data could change, um, but there, the oxytocin changes that are often attributed to this bonding 
they actually seem a lot more broad than that. It seems to be related to like trust and safety signaling, not just bonding, um, which is probably why it appears to be related to bonding. Uh, but that increases a lot during sexual arousal. You don't need a climax to have that benefit or that change. Interesting. Okay, cool. That's good to know. 